from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad that you're here at the Library of Congress. We hope that you've been able to uh, make new friends and to meet with your colleagues from across the metro area. And we're glad to introduce you to the Library of Congress itself. Our program today is uh, full of, of information that will help you learn how to find information. And I'll let the speakers do that. And to give uh, a welcome on behalf of the, of the Library of Congress, I'd like to introduce Dr. Colleen, Dr. Colleen Shogun, who is the Deputy Director of National and International Outreach. Would you welcome Dr. Colleen Shogun? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to the Library of Congress. It's great to see you all here today. Uh, once again, my name is Colleen Shogan. I'm the Deputy Director of National and International Outreach here at the library. And as you might know, we have a new, a fairly new librarian of Congress uh, here at LOC. Her name is Dr. Carla Hayden, and she asked me to welcome you here today. She regrets that she can't be here herself. Uh, she's super busy. She's, you know, in huge demand um, all across the city, all across the United States, and all across the world, but she definitely is a very big fan of this program. So since 1999, the library has hosted over 230 Haku interns, and we're very proud uh, to participate in this program, which brings new ideas, new minds, new talents to the Library of Congress. And we're also honored to have received the Haku President's Award for serving as a leader uh, of, of advocating for uh, diversity in the federal workforce. I understand that you've all had a brief tour already of the library, um, and as probably your docents or your tour guides have told you, this beautiful building that we're in today, the Jefferson Building, is really a testimony to a particular moment in time, uh, the particular moment in time when the United States was becoming a world power at the turn of the century, from the 19th century into the 20th century. Uh, so the building stands really for the idea that the United States would become a world leader as far as knowledge is concerned and as far as learning is concerned, and also educational access for everyone. The library has adopted the ideals of Thomas Jefferson. As we know, Thomas Jefferson was the founder, uh, in some ways, of the Library of Congress because he provided us with uh, the very first books to serve as the Library of Congress. He believed that free, unhampered pursuit of truth by an informed and involved citizen, citizenry was necessary, was necessary criteria for a democracy. It didn't mean that that was a nice thing to have in a democracy, but it was something that had to exist for a democracy to function and to flourish. And there was a time when most libraries strictly guarded their doors to knowledge. Uh, so libraries weren't always necessarily open or free to everyone, uh, but this institution was always dedicated to the idea of universal access and equal opportunity, and we still are, obviously, to this day. Everyone is welcome to the Library of Congress, and I feel very comfortable saying that because our new librarian really espouses that, um, that principle and talks about it on a daily basis. And what she means by that is the youngest uh, people, she calls them scholars in training, uh, people that are not even, can't even read yet, uh, kids that can't even read yet. Welcome to the Library of Congress. We have a young reader center uh, just one floor down, and she enjoys going there, uh, reading stories to them, reading books to them, trying to get kids engaged in the, the notion of reading and of learning all the way up to our high school students who we encourage to use the Library of Congress, uh, to our college students, and then our most senior scholars who come here to the library to write books and important research articles. Uh, so the library really belongs to everyone uh, from the whole range of uh, early learners all the way um, to our, our most senior intellectuals. And she really means uh, that sincerely. The Library of Congress is 
I'm not sure if you know this, but it is the largest repository of human knowledge in the world, which is pretty cool. I mean, it is. It is the place that has the most amount in one location of information and knowledge in the entire world. Uh, and that's pretty special. We have 3,000 people. I'll tell you a little bit about the numbers. What, so what does that mean? Um, 3,000 people work here at the library, about 3,000 people work here at the Library of Congress. We're the main research, research arm of the United States Congress. So we take that mission very, very seriously. Before I came to work in outreach here at the Library of Congress, I worked at the Congressional Research Service for many years, which is a division of the Library of Congress that works to serve members of Congress and staff, providing them with nonpartisan information and analysis about public policy issues uh, that are being debated today. We're also surrounded by 36 million catalog books here at the Library of Congress print materials in 460 foreign languages, 69 million manuscripts, the largest rare book collection in all of North America, and the world's largest collection of legal materials, films, maps, comic books, sheet music, and sound recordings. Uh, so it's not, the Library of Congress um, is not just books. Yes, books are a very, very important part of our 160 million object collection. So that's the foundation of our collection. But the library also, the Library of Congress also recognizes that you can learn from a lot of different types of materials and not just books. So the library collects widely, hence the notion that the library is the largest repository of human knowledge uh, in the world. So the amount of information is, when you think about it, um, is pretty mind-boggling. 160 million objects, uh, 160 million items that you can learn from at the Library of Congress. But then you might say, well, why is that so important today? Uh, you know, uh, why is it so important to have physical collections of, of these items? Because, you know, this phone, right, in my pocket can put easily 160 million pieces of information at my fingertips, and I can walk around with it, you know, all day here at the library, I can walk around with it at home, uh, you can use it for all kinds of uh, purposes, just curiosity or actual learning, scholarship, research, uh, it can be used uh, today. You can Google any question that you don't know the answer to. If you're in my house, you ask Alexa. That's what I like to do because I'm lazy. Um, so now I talk to, um, you know, uh, 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 almost like a virtual robot to answer questions for me. But the question is, so you have access. All this information is at your fingertips. There's not a question of the fact that we don't have access to information today. And you don't have to necessarily come to a library to, to read a book or to read a magazine article or to read a newspaper article. But the question is, can you distinguish between reliable sources? How do you know what is actually factually correct? Do you know the right questions to ask to get the answers that you need? Uh, and that works for anything. That works if you're using your phone. That works if you're using something like Alexa. My husband is very bad at asking Alexa questions. He asks her questions in the wrong way, and he never gets good answers. So, I mean, just using a, a simple device like that, if you don't know how to use it, then there may be a lot of information inside that device, but you can't gain access to the information that you need. And that's really where libraries play a major role. The vast amount of information is, that has now been made available has made libraries and librarians even more important. Some people would argue it's made libraries less important because we're all walking around with virtual libraries in our pockets or in our backpacks. But that's not really true. Simply access to more information doesn't mean that we don't need experts like we provide here at the Library of Congress or any library, right, public libraries, research libraries, that we don't require experts to help us find the right answers and the right sources. As Dr. Hayden likes to say, librarians are the original search engines. Library staff makes it easier for you to access uh, the correct information so that you know when you ask those questions that you're getting the most reliable and authoritative answers. Uh, this is not a place that is thriving on uh, the notion of fake news. Uh, this is not a fake news place. This is a place 
uh, that is, is premised upon the idea of giving you the best possible information and giving you the widest range information of information to answer the questions you, that you might ask. So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture on uh, the role of libraries and the uh, leadership that libraries play in the quest for knowledge. Um, as students, I urge you to return here to the Library of Congress someday and conduct your own research, whether it's research for a course that you're taking or research um, uh, for a paper that you're writing, or something just that you're personally curious about. It doesn't always have to be about something academic and intellectual, and I know that's probably your focus now because that's what your, your, your phase in life. But it doesn't have to be that when you come to the Library of Congress or you come to any, you know, even your local library. You can just want to ask a curious question about a hobby, about your genealogy, about historical backgrounds, about something about your family, or something about your community. And here at the Library of Congress, we're here to serve that entire range of, of uh, requests or information uh, that you might need. Knowing how to access and knowing how to ask the right questions to gain accurate information really is a skill that will help you no matter what career you decide to go, you decide to pursue. It doesn't really matter, but I will guarantee you that um, if you're in a job, it doesn't matter what job that you're in, uh, well, most jobs these days, but getting the answer correct is the most, is, is the, the most important aspect. Uh, you can do it quickly. Um, uh, you might be able to uh, write it in a, in a very clear, succinct way, but the bottom line is you have to get the answer has to be correct. It has to be authoritative. It needs to be supported by reliable sources. And gaining that resource and learning, those t and learning that skill is something that you can uh, really take advantage of here at the Library of Congress or any library. So I'm going to turn the program over to Jonathan. I think he's going to give us some announcements uh, about the program. But once again, welcome to the Library of Congress, and I hope you enjoy your day and your internship and the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shogun. Um, this is uh, really amazing to be here. Uh, first of all, yeah, my name is uh, Jonathan Santelis, and I'm the executive director uh, of the Haku National Internship Program. Uh, we're really happy and we're really fortunate uh, to be here. Uh, 2017 is our 25th year that our program has been uh, in existence. And um, over the course of those 25 years, a lot has, a lot has happened. Uh, we started with just one agency. Uh, and 24 interns, and now we have partnerships with about 20 or different agencies all across uh, the federal government. And we're very fortunate uh, to count on the Library of Congress as one of those agencies that has been a uh, consistent supporter of the internship program. Um, I have some uh, remarks that I want to make, but I also want to acknowledge the folks that uh, have made this uh, program possible. And so, First and foremost, um, the, the two individuals that were key in making this possible, uh, Ms. Hazel Seron, if you could please stand so we could acknowledge you and your work. All right, Hazel. And then also from um, our internship program, Ms. Uh, Francesca Rebar, she's back there. All right. So these two individuals uh, worked alongside with Library of Congress uh, staff to make this event possible. So please, um, later on today, please thank them for uh, the great work that they've done. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Library of Congress interns that we currently have uh, here. And so if you, when I uh, say your name, if you could please stand. Uh, Mr. Vincent Acuna. <laughs> Hazel, once again. Uh, Jocelyn, Ms. Jocelyn Gutierrez, Ms. Anna Munichkina, did I say that right? All right, close enough. And uh, Ms. Wendy Velasquez, Ebanks, please. Oh, there you are. Also want to uh, recognize that we have a few uh, Haku alumni uh, in the crowd 
that uh, were interns a few years back, not too long ago, right? Uh, and they're also here. And interns, I, I encourage you to uh, reach out to them, talk to them, uh, so you can hear their stories. Uh, so first of all, uh, Ms. Leah Kerwin. <laughs> Ms. Elia Melissa Gonzalez. Yeah. And Mr. Ricardo Gracia Figueroa, where are you? He's not here, he stepped out. All right, he's, he's, he's back to work. All right. Um, I'm going to close with just a, a few things. Uh, I've always encouraged the interns to, uh, as you're doing your internship, to capitalize on this opportunity. Uh, to take advantage of the resources. And you've gotten a lot of information from Dr. Shogun about all the amazing resources that are here. Uh, I want you to think of the Library of Congress as your library, okay? As a resource that you can tap into. Um, as well as within your agencies. This is the agency, this is your U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so definitely, as you're here, uh, don't be shy about taking in really the beauty of uh, this building and asking questions about all the amazing opportunities and resources that are here. Uh, with that, um, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much for coming here. And uh, go ahead and introduce our next uh, speaker, Mr. George Colburn who's the Chief of the National and International Outreach Office. Now that Jonathan's taken half of my uh, presentation, <laughs> mine will be very short. Um, <clears throat> really, I look out at the audience, and I, I'm just really very happy uh, that all of you could join us here today. This is a sentinel event uh, for this program. Um, I remember back in early 2000, I think, that uh, there was a, another new service unit called the Office of uh, Strategic Initiatives. And uh, the head of that service unit, Laura Campbell, who has since retired and gone on to even bigger things, uh, was very much an advocate for this type of program, um, for giving young men and women a chance uh, to immerse themselves in our nation's culture, uh, all the same time at promoting um, diversity uh, within the workforce. Um, the library has always had a history uh, most, especially most recently for promoting diversity. It's uh, like any other government institution. It waxes and wanes, but I tell you there are people here uh, that I can say uh, are truly committed uh, to promoting diversity in the workplace. But today is a celebra celebration of, I always get this mixed up, is it Haku or HNIP? <laughs> so we'll say today uh, to celebrate HNIP's uh, program here at the library. And I would be remiss not to say that I want to thank uh, Eric Eldridge uh, and Julie Lee. Julie, the two of you stand up. Uh, because they are <laughs> Hazel's. Uh, they are Hazel's mentor. Uh, Hazel has been a real addition to this team. Uh, we're a relatively small team, uh, and, and I think they've worked extremely well uh, on program, this program, as well as major national and international programs that come out of our office, so I thank you all. Um, really, I want you to know that this program is truly a critical component um, and shows the library's commitment to promoting a diverse, as I said, workforce to support uh, the inclusiveness 
uh, uh, the culture of inclusiveness uh, here at the library. Uh, I know over the years it's been some changes um, in uh, the way we do things, both from senior administration and at the service unit level, but this is always held the same and with the, with the event of IFP, which is the Intern and Fellowship Program, which is part of the National and International Outreach Service Unit, uh, we are committed to really broadening our reach uh, for internships, fellowships, and residencies uh, in our country. Um, as I said, Jonathan's already thanked the Spring Haku interns here at the library. I want to thank you. We met not too long ago. I was joking with Yaslin and told her I was going to call her up to say a few words. Uh, but uh, they've been a great group. Uh, they have made some major contributions. Um, and I especially want to take this uh, time to thank Jonathan and Noel. Um, they've been wonderful partners. We've sparred over the years. Um, but uh, that's, that's what makes it a, a, a good relationship, is uh, that we're, we do some give and take. Um, but they have really brought some great talent here to the library. Now, for this event, we're very fortunate to have an exceptional leader and librarian. Uh, the Director of Diversity and Leadership Programs at the Association of Research Libraries, or the ARL, uh, Mark Puente, who will challenge you to think creatively about your future. At the Association of Research Libraries, Mark directs all aspects of the Association's diversity recruitment and leadership development programs and serves as the ARL staff liaison to the ARL Committee on Diversity and Leadership. Now, Mark's research interest, uh, from what we understand, and we hope we have this right, Mark, are centered on diversity and leadership, particularly in the context of academic research libraries and fine arts librarianship. Mark has been actively involved with diversity and leadership issues since the beginning of his library career. Mark, at one time, was also an intern. He is also a graduate of the Minnesota Institute for Early Career Librarians and the Harvard ACRL Leadership Institute. In his responsibilities for the ARL re Career Resources, he designs and directs the annual ARL Leadership Symposium and leads the planning of the Biennial National Diversity in Libraries Conference. Mark has presented at regional and national conferences on topics such as networking, minority recruitment strategies, diversity, inclusion in the workplace, and residency programs in academic libraries. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Mark Puente and please join him and welcome him to the Library of Congress. Thank you very much for that welcome. Um, I'm really delighted to be here as I was listening to the remarks. I'm gonna time myself to help dictate how fast how quickly or how slowly I can talk. So, um, no, I'm really delighted to be here. And as I was listening to some of the opening programs, I was thinking about my own experiences, not only as a library and information science professional, but I also had a previous career as a music educator. Um, and in my experiences, it was really the relationships that I built through the course of those two careers, but especially I can tell you a little bit about my educational path uh, to librarianship and some cohorts that were built as I pursued my Master of Library and Information Science, and also I was a Spectrum Scholar, uh, which is a large scholarship program that is funded and sponsored by the American Library Association. And some of those relationships that I built through those programs are really ones that uh, endure uh, some 16 
uh, 17 years later, and I know that you are, have the potential to build some lifelong relationships that can really help bolster and help guide you. Um, you'll be developing peer mentors through this experience, so um, I really invite you to fully really think about taking advantage of the relationships that you're building here. I mean, the money was always really great. The scholarship money was great, you know, less student loan debt, all that sort of thing. The practical experience that I had in some of my, uh, in my fellowship experience was really wonderful. But uh, when I think about my, um, what, what maybe has been most impactful, I really think about those relationships. So please do that. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit today. It's always in the context, uh, all in the context of librarianship, of course, because that's the current uh, that's the world in which I, uh, through which I navigate right now. But I'm going to tell you a little, start off just by telling you a little bit about myself, uh, because I hope it's a little bit re relevant. Uh, I was born in, in San Antonio, Texas. Um, this is my beautiful hometown. Uh, I love it. I miss it. I go back there. I still have a home there. I go back very, very frequently. I grew up in uh, a pretty modest, uh, I would say a working class uh, neighborhood in San Antonio. This is an intentional, for those of you who may be old enough to remember, my intentional homage to uh, the Ricky Ricardo, Lucy and Ricky Ricardo show, um, if you can see the heart there. But uh, my father was a brick mason growing up in San Antonio for a uh, better part of 60 years. Uh, my mother uh, was, at the time that my parents met in the 50s, she was uh, a, a, a credit clerk in a local, in a downtown retailer uh, in set, downtown San Antonio. Uh, and they met, they lived, grew up in the same neighborhood. My father was uh, great, a good singer, uh, and that sort of thing. I should have given you, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the, uh, the trigger alert to this. Uh, because this slide represents, really, I guess, uh, the change. This is very much a part of the reality that my parents grew up in. The parents, the San Antonio that my parents grew up in was very, very segregated, very divided. And not only around racial, uh, ethnic lines as is uh, represented here in this slide, but uh, across many, many other lines. Um, so it was, it was difficult and my parents pretty much, I would say, really encouraged my brothers and I to assimilate right, to become more like the, the majority culture, right, the, the, the dominant cultures uh, that were in San Antonio at the time because that's what they saw would be, uh, that's what they thought would be our pathway to success. Hopefully some of that, a lot of that maybe is changing now as I think about uh, people that I am trying to shepherd through in my uh, capacity at ARL into higher education, into graduate education, and into careers in librarianship. Now, the San Antonio, I'm old enough, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those cuspers. I was a, a baby boomer, but just on the cusp of it. So, um, but um, the San Antonio that my parents grew up in, like I said, was very, very divided. Within one, less than probably, it was probably five square blocks. There was the church for the Latinx community, the Hispanics and Latinos. There was the church for those of German and Czech descent. And there was another church for the African Americans or the black, or the, the black congregations. So it was very, very divided. And about uh, the late 60s, that started to kind of break down a, a little bit. And uh, the San Antonio that I grew up in, especially into my teens, especially into my 20s and 30s, was really very, very integrated with the majority cultures really embracing the, 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 the flavors and, and, and the smells and the, the sounds of the Latinx culture, right? Our food. If you've ever been to San Antonio, has anybody been to San Antonio? I hope some of you have. Who, who, who are, anybody here from San Antonio? Yeah? No? No? Okay. I miss breakfast tacos more than anything, I think. Um, so anyway, but, you know, home of the, the, the Alamo, our world-famous river walk, and lots of, lots of great food. Uh, please come visit. Um, when I was a kid, uh, backtracking just a few years later, this was really my first experience with the library, and that was with the San Antonio Public Library. We call that color enchilada red. Um, because of, you know, uh, the, uh, right, the, the, uh, um, the likeness to uh, the red tortillas and uh, but anyway, and this is where I first became both uh, familiar with the resources that libraries um, steward and also with the personnel, the people that steward those resources and that really took an interest in me and in my life, in my career, in my development at a pretty early age. So that was it. A little bit about my experience. I should say, and I do want to tell you um, a little bit about my organization, the Association of Research Libraries, uh, which is right here in Washington, D.C. Um, it is not like a, a, a lot of uh, associations. The Association of Research Libraries is an institutional organization of 124 of the top 
well, largest, we would say, research libraries in the United States and Canada. So a lot of your land grant, grant universities, your big uh, state schools, uh, colleges and universities are members of ours. A lot of your um, the Ivy League schools are members. And then we have a couple of public libraries that are members, the New York Public Library, Boston Public Library, and we have quite a few federal libraries. Library of Congress, where you're visiting today, the National Library of Medicine, the National Archives, which is just down the street. I hope some of you might have an opportunity to visit at NARA, uh, did I say the National Library of Medicine? That's the other one. I think those are the, the, the Federals. And excuse me, I'm, I'm very warm today. Sorry about that. So um, I was asked, asked to talk a little bit about, about the profession. And we heard a little bit already about why, why libraries are still relevant today and why should be they be in the age of fake news, uh, in the age of ubiquitous information where you can literally get on Google or get on your phone and find information almost anywhere, why is this profession still important, right? And that has already been expressed a little bit. But what is a library? What makes a library, right? Most people, when they think of libraries, they think of very large repositories as, as, as this esteemed um, uh, institution here, right? We think of books. We think of manuscripts, right? Papers, people's papers. Before there was email, people would write uh, memos <laughs> and actually send them to people. Um, auto recordings, uh, videos. I was actually a music librarian when I was actually still uh, a practicing librarian. Uh, that's what I did. I have a, a master's degree in vocal performance, um, and that's what I did uh, for a little while before coming over to the, to the dark side of association work. Um, we think about maps, we think about periodicals, right? Not too many newspapers around them anymore, most of those are in digital format, uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, libraries traditionally collect all those sorts of things. A lot of the journals that you, who are in academic institutions, you know, that, that you uh, gain access to every single day. So, so what is a library? Well, things have changed a little bit, right? Or maybe quite a lot. <laughs> so libraries are still repositories, right? Places where there are lots of collections of things, of these physical things that you can touch, that you can smell, that you can read, that you can take out and take to the, take to the beach, right? These sorts of things. But there are also a lot of different things these days, right? And especially in my context, which is academic and research libraries, it's a lot about digital content a lot about digital content. It's about databases, right? It's about these large databases that index the resources that you need for your research papers and that sort of thing, so that you can go and perform searches to figure out what exactly are the best resources for the research that you're trying to do. Electronic and digital resources, that's the actual content, right? The actual articles that you seek out um, to do your research or to find information or to entertain yourself, if that's you know, how you choose to access that information. A lot of what's happening in libraries right now, I think is very exciting. This is one of the most exciting pieces of it, is about maker spaces, right? And we're talking everything from, you know, from um, primary school age children to very, very advanced, like gaming technology that informs things like, you know, like, like these sophisticated uh, uh, war modeling and things like that. It's really a very interesting um, and exciting thing. If you have an opportunity, I, I encourage you to get online and look for the North Carolina State University and look for, there's, there are videos about the Hunt Library. It's a, a SciTech campus in, 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 uh, in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. And they, will, they have some of the most interesting things that you'll ever see. Huge walls where they do data visualization. They have uh, gaming uh, areas where people work with gaming technology and that sort of thing. Um, Streaming audio and video, right? These large aggregators, uh, these people who collect all of this content of, of speeches, of sound, of you know, every variety of music um, and art that you can imagine uh, and make that uh, content uh, available just you know, on your phone or on a laptop. Um, and data, 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 data. Data is huge these days, right? I'm sure you all know that. <laughs> um, you can make a career out of just how to manage uh, and describe data. And then thinking about libraries as really extending much, much, much beyond the walls, but also how it exists in the virtual in virtual reality, right? And all these resources that are interconnected on a, on, on a global scale, especially with respect to researchers and that sort of thing, uh, in terms of sharing resources on the cloud and that sort of thing. So did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Is the library anything else to you other than what I've articulated here today in just these few bullet points? 
It's people? Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is people, right? Exactly. Anything else? Nope, I've covered it all. Okay, good, great, excellent, good. So let's go back to the people, the people aspect of it. So what is this thing that we call a librarian, <laughs> right? People who go through formal education today is largely called the library and information science. Um, there are many different sectors, uh, as I mentioned earlier. There are those in public libraries, like the one that I showed the picture of in the San Antonio Public Library. There are those who are employed and engaged in schools as um, school librarians are as media specialists. There are academic libraries, librarians that are focused largely on college and university campuses. And there are special libraries, things like law librarians, things like those who are focused on health sciences, um, are also uh, science and technology, these sorts of things. So these have been sort of the largely traditional categories, I think, of those people, of the personnel. And things are, again, changing quite a bit and have changed quite a bit. So when we think about librarians today, these are a lot of the, this is a lot of the taxonomy, a lot of the language that we use to describe the role of people. Public services, that traditional reference librarian that you would go up to at a desk, even though those are kind of disappearing a lot these days, right, uh, because of electronic um, means, but uh, the one that you would go up and ask a reference question to. Access services, the type of person that allows uh, access that will rent, uh, that will check out, not rent, but check out a book to you and that sort of thing, or that will organize the resources in the library. Instruction librarians, that's very, very important. Instruction librarians who teach people how to think critically about those resources that they're searching for when they're doing research, when they're trying to find an answer to a question, and many, many others. Technical services is about description, right? It's about creating those taxonomies and those terms that are going to uh, help you when you go to a search engine to, um, to uncover a resource that you really need. Uh, subject li uh, are li liaison librarians and getting into the technical part of it. Those who deal with the back end, like the systems librarians that deal with the, 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 the um, computer infrastructure to make a library work today. But these days, and on, on this other side, on the right side of the, of, I've, uh, of the slide, I have highlighted some interesting roles that are currently um, in much demand, in high demand, especially in a research intensive environment, in an academic environment. Scholarly publishing or scholarly communications librarians that deal with all that creative, that research output, all of those journals that are being published at very, very, very high cost to the consumer and to students who are, you know, you've, you've, you've had to pay for a lot of these, right? Um, digital stewardship and digital archivists, electronic resources. These days in an academic library, sometimes as much as 70% of a library's budget can go toward electronic resources as opposed to monograph, as opposed to books, which by the way, so often even the traditional book, the preferred mode of delivery is often in, electro in an electronic form also. Uh, things like digital humanities, looking across these human the, um, the humanities um, uh, disciplines and the engagement of digital resources and textual analysis and this sort of thing. Uh, you, user experience and assessment, looking at things like uh, computer human interaction and that sort of thing. Uh, geographic and inform information systems, very, very much in demand today. And of course, looking at pairing this with the public services and the instruction, instructional design. Looking at those pedagogies within an academic institution that is going to optimize learning for students, that's going to allow you to learn as much as you possibly can and position you to find the answers to those research questions. So those are some of the kind of sexier, if you would, uh, um, sexier roles today. As opposed to information science these days, which I can go on a little bit, we've talked a little bit about it, uh, but in terms of uh, a focus on knowledge management, in terms of just, you know, uh, taking the, uh, uh, um, the scope, uh, a survey of what knowledge is within the purview, uh, is within uh, your personnel and that sort of thi thing, web services, health informatics, looking at health information on a broad scale as well as small scales, uh, looking at network information, cyber infrastructure, we talked about a lot of this, and looking at information architecture. In other words, all of the things behind um, all of these tools that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis to find information and how is that technology assisting that. 
So that's a, a bit about the profession today. There are lots of really interesting and exciting things. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, going on in the profession. And I just wanted to give you a little glimpse about that. But for the next few minutes, I just want to talk about the other side of what I do, which is why I think uh, largely I'm here today, and that is talking about the diversity of the profession and inclusion in, profession, in the profession. A lot of times what people think about when they think about diversity is thinking about this, statistics. Statistics about representation, okay? How many women are in the profession, right? How many Lat Latinx are in the profession? That sort of thing, right? How many people uh, who are veterans uh, are in your workforce and that sort of thing? Those things are terribly, terribly important and I think we do have to think about those. Librarianship is not real different from many, many sectors. It's about, I mean, when we look overall in terms of sectors, it's kind of right in the middle. Not quite as good as maybe nursing, not quite as good as, re as, as, as um, the military, uh, not quite as good maybe as education, but a bit better than other sectors. And I apologize that the, um, <laughs> that the, the, the slide here is a little bit um, strange in, in its display. But this is where we are, our small group of 124 uh, libraries. Actually, this represents 99 of them in the universe, in, uh, in colleges and universities in the U.S. because we don't track those data in, for our Canadian institutions. But right now, or as effective at 2014, 2015, we had about almost 15 percent representation of racial and ethnic uh, minorities, if you would, people from historically underrepresented groups. And that's only representing those, those um, categories that are listed there. This is where we were in 1998, so we were at about 11.2%, so we haven't grown a heck of a lot in spite of a lot of um, scholarship opportunities and pipeline programs such as the ones that you are participating in. This is where we are profession-wide. Profession-wide within library and information science, we are at about 12% representation of racial and ethnic minorities, okay? So we clearly have a long way to go if we're going to represent the populations that we serve. This is what gender looks like in our uh, university libraries. So we're at about 36.4% male. This is actually, these data are a little bit older. Uh, the library, librarianship in general is about, actually depending on what source, you consult about 82 to 86% women. Um, and then age diversity. It's actually very, very diverse. We're at a stage right now where we basically have about um, five generations in the professional workforce at this particular time, which creates all kinds of interesting challenges, I think, and, and opportunities. And then this is where we are, or this is where we are projected that we will be in the United States by 2050, that we will be at about 50 percent representation um, of, of those, those four categories again. So we have a long way to go. And this is where higher education is. Also moving very, very quickly, becoming much more diverse very, very quickly. So how are we doing on time? Okay. I just want to maybe touch just very, very quickly on two, two other points. What I see going on in the work that I do, I think has, is, is very, very critical. We are at a critical juncture here within our profession, within our society, within the United States. There has been sort of a, a transfer of thinking, if you will, a thinking about the state of diversity, which is really only about a, a state of being, right? And thinking about the work that we do as centering on inclusion, that is creating environments where people like you and like me feel welcome, like we don't have to fake it to fit in, in these environments that we, that in which we work right, and with our colleagues. I think that, you know, like the business sector has been talking about inclusion for the better part of probably 25 or 30 years or so. Um, I like this, you know, this definition. Diversity is just the mix of all of those human identities and inclusion is really making the mix work. But this is what I see, and you can't see the bottom. I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll explain to that. This is where I think we are headed today. This natural progression from thinking about diversity taking it a step further, thinking about inclusion, and then even towards equity, focusing on social justice, and that last bullet point that you can't see is decolonization. I think we are at a stage where 
although I think at programs like this internship program that you're involved with, like the scholarship programs that I manage are ter terribly important, right? When we think about diversifying our workforce, right, where do we have opportunities to really affect change? We're not gonna change the demographics of, the, of my age group, the 40 to 60 year olds. We're not gonna affect change there. We are going to affect, affect change at your level, at people who are just now entering whatever professional environment that you're preparing yourself to enter, right? Now the idea of colonization I think is an important one and it's one that we really have to think critically about uh, because it really focuses us, uh, forces us to focus on systems, on those historical barriers to inequality and to inequity. Those things that throughout our, our, throughout our history, especially a lot of it here in the US, has really created those systemic barriers to true inclusion being created. So I could say a lot more about that. We'll, uh, we maybe hopefully we'll, we'll save time for that. Just a last um, few comments. Um, thinking about leadership and thinking about management, and I want to differentiate those for you. It's important, I think, for many of you to develop managerial skills, that is, budgetary management, right, project management skills, these sorts of things, personnel management skills, um, to better yourself and to help allow yourself to advance in your profession. But I want to close thinking about and give you a challenge to be thinking about leadership and how that is different than management. I love these guys, Kuzes and Posner. Uh, they're very, very big in the research literature. And this is how they define leadership. The art of mobilizing others to want to struggle for shared aspirations. I'm gonna go into this just a little bit more as I close. I want you to think about, this is also based on, on that Kuzes and Posner's model, about leadership being everybody's business. So it's not about positional authority. You do not have to be Carla Hayden to be a leader. You do not have to be the CEO of a company to be a leader, right? Leadership can and should happen at any layer of an organization. Leadership is also about building relationships. It's about building relationships with the people that you would like to lead, that are willing to embrace your vision of where you would like to take them. It's also about self-development. It's about creating what we, what we say in the leadership, the leadership says, uh, um, literature says authority and credibility. So I challenge you to, to, to think about creating a path to becoming the best practitioner you can possibly be because that lends to that credibility. The best leaders are the best, the best learners. They're always on the path to improving themselves, to improving their practice, and it, to take, and it is deliberate. You really have to think about it. It's also intentional. Um, a last few things, last few things. I would hope that in whatever you decide to, to pursue professionally and, and outside of your profession, that the things that you take leadership in align with your values, with your belief structure. That is really critical and that is going to feed you as you develop yourself as leaders. Leadership requires modeling. It means that you not only have to tell people how to act <laughs> and what to do, but you have to constantly model that behavior for the people who want to follow you. And it requires vision. It requires a vision that can be articulated, that can be shared, and that, can, that other people can buy into. We talked about credibility. Oh, goodness, sorry. And then, and finally, leadership is about building trust. It's about building trust so that people will want to follow you and that will want to fully embrace that vision. So I'll end up with a little bit of Dr. Seuss. This is why I pe think people from underrepresented groups, people from your age bracket, if I can be a little ageist here, have to think about leadership. People are often frustrated with leadership, right? Right? People complain about their bosses if we're talking about managerial leadership. They, 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 they complain about their bosses a lot. And if you don't take the time to care an awful lot about the work that you're doing and about the organization that employs you, and if you don't build within yourself the desire to be a leader, then you're leaving leadership up to some other people who maybe don't have the skills or don't have the vision or don't have the passion, to, to at least the, enough to want you to, to, to follow them. So think about this a little bit and we can open this up for discussion. Those are my comments.
Questions, comments? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, so actually it's systemic. We want to think about systemic. This is the example that I give, um, particularly in academe, as I think about the, um, the promotion and tenure system in a traditional, um, how many of you want to be academics? You want to be professors? Anybody here want to be professors? No? You? Yes, you want to be a professor? Okay. So thinking about the world experience and thinking about things like that are really, really critical to people achieving tenure in a university, right? So permanent status, continuing status, has a lot to do with mentorship and it has a lot to do with being, being exposed to things. People from historically underrepresented groups frequently do not have that, that experience. They do not have that worldview. They do not have people and mentors. It's very, very, very difficult for them to find people to engage with and to have conversations with to talk about the struggles of what that promotion and tenure process is like. So that systemic thing is that the system was really built, if we think about how universities were built many, many, many moons ago, um, it was really built to ensure that the literate classes stayed in power, right? That's, that's really, it, it really wasn't about dissemination at the time, okay? So that means that there is this historical legacy that, that, that really is built around higher education that makes it very, very difficult for people of color to achieve, um, to, to achieve tenure. Um, so that's just kind of an example. I mean, I can give you, you know, lots of other examples that are based on economics, right, that are based on um, any number of different factors. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Other questions or comments? Reflections. Yes. Into librarianship itself? Yeah. Sure. So, what can be done to um, recruit or to encourage more minorities to enter librarianship? I would. I would say that. Can I expand that question? And let's talk about any field. <laughs> So I think that, let me give you an example in, in librarianship. You know, we've had these programs, these scholarship, these pipeline programs that have been very, very beneficial, that have offered lots of money. I, I was a, a product of one of those. I'm a graduate of the University of Arizona program. Um, it, they have a program called the Knowledge River Program, which focuses specifically on Latinx and Native American populations to try to recruit them into librarianship. So I got that in second master's with no student loan debt, which is a, a, a social justice issue, by the way, right? right? Social justice because of the finances involved with that. So, but, but here's the thing. The recruitment addresses the numbers, but it doesn't address retention. The 12% that I talked about of representation across racial and ethnic minorities within the profession has been static for about, the 20, about 20 years in spite of a lot of programs. So we are only able to, being able to recruit as many people from historically underrepresented groups as there is attrition, okay? Now, a lot of them, there could be lots of reasons for attrition, but we know from research that one of the reasons there is attrition is because people are going to higher paying sectors, right? But also because frequently they are encountering barriers, barriers to promotion, uh, to continuance, that sort of thing. And they're finding in many, in many instances, they're finding the institutions and the organizations where they are employed and engaged to be less than inclusive, right? Where they don't feel welcome, where they do feel like they, in order to be successful, they have to really kind of fake it. Um, they have to, you know, play the game and act like, you know, they're from majority cultures, and that's very, very difficult and very disheartening, and that is why some people leave. So I think it's a very, that's a very long answer to say that if we can focus on culture and building cultures of inclusion and also to think about what, what interventions are necessary, you know, what do we as leaders, people, you know, who are in positional authority, what do they have to do to instill within the, their organization an authentic um, commitment 
to creating an inclusive environment. That is a very, very difficult conversation, but luckily, you know, from my vantage point with the ARL, which our, our member representatives are all the, the CEOs, they're all the deans, the directors, the university, the head librarians of these large organizations, um, those, are, or, those are conversations that they are much more willing to have these days, and so I'm very excited about the future of that. But I, I, I do think that that is very much part of it. Comments, yes, questions, yes. Library of Congress? I <laughs> can you, can you, can How do you show leadership yes. rather than management when working with employees and interns? Right. That's that's your question. Yes. Yeah. And that give sure. Um, I think that that I mean there are there are built in, as, 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 if I'm not mistaken, there are built in opportunities. For example, to cultivate leadership development within LC, there have been historically. They still yes. exist. Yes. Yep. Wow. Yep. Exactly. Um, and we and we do that as well at the ARL, the Association of Research Libraries. That we have several leadership development programs where we build these cohorts. We take people out of their work everyday workplace context. Although I think LC focused specifically on this institution, and 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 allows people to, to to take time out of their days to develop these interests and to understand first of all what are the philosophies, what are the theories behind developing yourself as a leader, and then secondly, what do you do? You know, providing practical, real world opportunities for applications of those skills within the workforce. So I think one of the things that, that, that myself, I mean, what I have found within, with working with students that are largely graduate students is that, I mean, they are eager. They are really eager to lead conversations, projects, initiatives, whatever that sort of thing is. And what we need to do as leaders is simply give them the agency <laughs> to, to, to let them do it. I mean, leadership is about, I think true leadership is about cultivating the talent within your constituency, whatever that is, and then letting them do it, right? Just letting them go. And sometimes that means leading, allowing them to fail, right? But hopefully you have the, the infrastructure and the mentoring capacity behind that to to kind of offset some of that, if, you know, hopefully that, that exists. But um, I think that, that that's largely um, most of it, is allowing that person or those people to develop those interests, to develop those skills, and then giving them a really, a, 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 an opportunity uh, to practically engage those skills and, um, um, and see where it goes. Thank you. That's, that's a, that was a rough question. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Well, I think we'll wrap things up then, so thank you. Oh, yes, I will stay here, yes, absolutely. Um, so in, in closing, I wanna ask, uh, can you just tell me some of the majors that you're, that you're coming from over in this area? What majors are you from? Social work? Sociology? Business? Public health? Communications? Marketing? Regulatory science. So mm -hmm. there are libraries for all of those Absolutely. endeavors. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, there are. Yeah. How, how yep. many of you know the libraries that specialize in your career's field? So if you were into agriculture, there's the National Agricultural Library. Right. But it's also important for you to, to understand that you have a home library. So how many of you still have a library card from your home area? Maybe. Well, yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I've noticed is that information is becoming expensive. And it's really important for us to look at this. Uh, if you've looked at a local newspaper, you've found that they're, they want to charge you a subscription fee. You get three articles a month that you get. <laughs> that you get. After that, you need to pay for those kinds of things. You, having a membership in your local library, maintaining a, a, a link with your school library allows you to have other open doors. And I think that right. that's the part of librarianship that is gonna lead you in your generation.
to be able to figure out other smarter ways to mm -hmm. continue to have mm -hmm. access. Any other right. closing uh, remarks about access to information in their time? Yeah, it, I mean, I've just, I mean, just to reiterate what you said, I think we're in a in an environment where where information, I mean, it's so ubiquitous, and it's really, really difficult to 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 manage that uh, and to figure out what is most relevant to us because this is gonna help us inform, you know, who we are as citizens, <laughs> you know, and, and things like, you know, where we, where we donate and who we vote for and, you know, what schools we support and what school policies we support and that sort of thing. So I think it's really, really critical um, to, to think about how, how that filter is developed within you. I mean, it's, um, it's probably more important than ever, I think, so, yeah. But, and also to say that if anybody is interested or would like more information about scholarship opportunities, I I'm, I'm, can certainly have com conversations with you and can point you to resources about plenty of scholarship opportunities for library and information science. So happy to do that as well. Again, thank you very much sure, for being here you. today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, we do want to thank you for coming here today. We hope that your experience at the Library of Congress is something that will whet your appetite, that you will come back. Bring your friends, bring your families. We have weekend tours, but there's so much available at your fingertips. So do visit us on site and online. Thank you very much for coming to the Library of Congress. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.